like we said, we have a few, uh, quite a few uh, slides to get through. We'll kind of go through them, but I also kind of want to leave enough room at the time of the lecture to kind of go over some uh, questions that you have, key specifics that I bring up, and because uh, there's a lot of confusion out there with media and, and, and also with marketing and, and can confuse a lot of different things. So I want to leave enough time at the end for questions, but um, we're going to start with a quick video um, to kind of put a little bit of realness into this, a little bit of a real patient of mine that actually had both his hips done. Uh, he was one of the first in the, uh, Western Michigan to have both his hips done at the same time. Um, and this is just a quick video we'll play at the beginning and this kind of ties into everything we're going to be talking about tonight. Sports enthusiast Steve Shaner knows all too well how ailing joints impact mobility, lifestyle, and overall health. Well, I thought I was walking good and people at work were saying, well, what's wrong with you? You're not walking too well. Came home and asked my wife, I said, everyone's saying I'm walking kind of goofy. And she looked at me and she said, you are. Joints play a significant role in not just mobility, but overall human health, as health is motion. Last year I only took this boat out four or five times during the whole season because the waves and standing so long hurt my hips. For an active person, it's real tough to sit around, especially watching all my friends and buddies do the stuff that we used to do together, and I can't do any of it. He's a very active uh, gentleman. He's uh, very active in his uh, job and very active otherwise, and has significant uh, pain in both of his hips, complete cartilage loss in both hips. On a scale of one to 10, it's usually about eight, but by the end of the day, it's 10. I sit in that chair and I don't move. Joint damage can be caused by accident, wear and tear, or arthritis, as is the case with many hip replacements. Advances in surgical technique and prosthesis have allowed more patients to return to their active lifestyle with shorter recovery times. I think the technology is there to uh, support uh, somebody getting back to his active lifestyle um, with the implants that we have today. Joint replacement requires coordinated expertise and best-in-class technology, a continuum of care that offered hope for Steve. Just the amount of pain I'm in, I was looking for relief and Dr. Johnson told me that when I wake up, I won't have any joint pain. So I'm real excited to get this going and waking up with no joint pain. <laughs> See you. Ready to get this done? I'm ready to get a couple new hips. There you go. Raise that up uh, leg up for me. He had the anterior total hip replacement, which is a muscle sparing approach, which is a unique procedure with a unique table that uh, we can do both of his hips at the same time. Technology becomes the eyes of the surgeon, allowing precise placement. So we, did, we went ahead and uh, did his right side first, followed by the left. Three hours later, Steve emerges from one of the first bilateral anterior approach hip replacements. He's happy to learn that both hips were replaced. Got them both done. Yep. Everything went well. Um, the procedure went uh, to plan and very smoothly. Well, the day of surgery, when I woke up, the joint pain was gone in both hips. I didn't have any joint pain. Last night, I was able to stand up next to the bed. I walked to the chair and sat down. Holland Hospital is a destination for diagnosis, consultation, and treatment, including joint repair and replacement, as well as rehabilitation. This has really surprised me, being able to move like this. I didn't know what to expect. I didn't think I'd be walking stairs less than 29 hours after surgery. For joint procedures requiring more lengthy rehabilitation, occupational therapists and rehabilitation facilities both contribute to a sound recovery, while community outreach programs offer continuing education, all delivered to a higher standard of care from an ISO Top 100 organization. That's going to change my life. I'll be able to do stuff I used to be able to do. I'm excited. I'm ready. So, 
Okay. Stem, ball, cup. Same on the matching set on the other sides. Thank you yep. so much. All right. <laughs> you gave me another chance of playing hard again. Well, that's I good. I appreciate that. Yeah, no, it's good. If you're suffering from joint pain, why not take advantage of Holland Hospital's comprehensive joint repair and replacement services, a center of excellence in coordinated orthopedic care. Join the many patients who have returned to a full range of motion and an active, healthy lifestyle, like Steve. Well, it's been a couple of months since I've uh, had surgery. I feel like a million bucks. Now at the gym, lifting heavy again, I'm out fishing a lot, and I feel great. Never felt this good in a long time. Ask your primary care physician, or contact the Bone and Joint Center in Holland today. We'll kind of get on to the lecture here. That is just a brief, I always like bringing in a patient that either had surgery than yesterday or, you know, but they're already gone. So I kind of like to bring that in a little bit to the presentation. We'll kind of go over uh, uh, hip and knee replacement surgery. We'll kind of talk about the advances uh, in it a little bit before treatments um, and understanding joint pain. We'll kind of get through, there's a lot of slides. Uh, we'll kind of get through a lot of this quite quickly. Um, to get uh, open this up for questions at the end. Um, these are just uh, some pictures of some patients out there um, that had total hip replacement. All of these have uh, had a hip replacement. And we'll kind of go into some of the nuances before that. Osteoarthritis is, uh, affects the knees and the hips ma mainly. They're the weight-bearing uh, joints. Um, all arthritis is is a loss of cartilage on the end of the bone. It's basically the loss of cushion in between the joint space. Um, it's kind of like the brake pads or tire treads um, being lost. And the number of people being affected by arthritis is uh, steadily increasing, um, becoming the most common problem from long-term disability and pain. Um, second most common diagnosis for anybody with pain uh, seen by the primary care uh, physicians. Um, second uh, to back pain is number one. Um, osteoarthritis is the loss of that cartilage space or brake pad or tire tread, I like to say, uh, most, uh, most likely from um, wear and tear. Um, it's characterized by joint pain in the hip and knee, stiffness, um, deformity. Also loss of mobility or stiffness can occur as well. I kind of liken it to a rusty joint, so to speak. Um, a normal healthy joint is well lubricated with good motion, free of pain. Um, with a joint, an arthritic joint is the loss of that cartilage or cushion, um, losing the lubricating mechanis, uh, mechanism with the fluid at the joint, um, also losing motion and stiffness caused by the pain itself. Causes, um, what causes osteoarthritis, osteoarthritis, um, what actually causes it's a multifactorial. It can be a lots of different things. It can be abnormal ad anatomy or uh, deformity of uh, structure uh, that you're born with. It can be abnormal biology of the synovial fluid. Genetics can play a use, and probably one of the biggest things is just wear and tear, um, overuse, um, like your brake pad or tire tread. Risk factors, um, as we age, that kind of goes hand in hand with the wear and tear as we age, um, is a loss of cartilage on the end of the bone. Uh, obesity or weight gain, the more pressure that we have on the tires, so to speak, can uh, wear those uh, cushions out a lot quicker. Inactivity or lack of exercise is um, shown to uh, affect the synovial fluid and the lubricating mechanism of the knee, also leading to the stiffness as well. Prior trauma, obviously any trauma or surgery on that joint can lead to early arthritis or cartilage loss um, and, and normal joint anatomy. Um, different birth um, deformities of the bone can lead to um, early advancement of arthritis. How do we know? Um, these are just different telling signs. Difficult getting out of a low-seated car. Difficulty getting up from a low-seated chair. Uh, stiffness. Uh, this is a classic one. On, you know, one day I was able to tie my shoes and the next day it's not happening anymore. Uh, difficulty getting on socks, tying shoes. Not keeping up with those around you, talking about people saying that you have a limp, um, not walking straight, why can't you keep up? Um, 
realizing that there's pain in the hip and knee. We're basically um, keeping this to um, kind of uh, the hip and knee arthritis. Um, a lot of people kind of want to dig their head in the sand and kind of ignore it a little bit or put up with it, but um, we'll kind of talk a little bit that it's a pretty simple diagnosis to make. It's a consultation with your physician, primary care, or a orthopedic surgeon that would kind of just take a history and take a listen to your um, the pain and how it's affecting you on a day-to-day -day basis, what's not as easy to do as it once was before. And then this is a simple physical exam where we're just kind of putting that knee through a range of motion. It's amazing. I don't need x-rays to really tell me that a joint's arthritic. Looking at the stiffness of it and the deformity of it and then how it moves on exam, bending the knee, bending the hip around, and then a simple x-ray uh, to look at the joint space itself to see if there's cartilage on the end of the bone. And that's a simple x-ray in the office. I have my x-ray machine five feet from the exam room. We have those on uh, computer screens that we come into the room with and just take a look and go over all that. We just kind of went through all of those, range of motion of the hip and knee. Very important after recovery uh, to get those range of motion back. Deformity, this person here has got a little bit more space between the knee. That's becoming a little bit more bow-legged. You also can become a little bit knock-kneed with time as well, depending on where the arthritis in the knee is. And these are kind of pictures illustrating that. Knock-kneed on the right, bow-leggedness on the left, and that's because of where wear patterns are occurring in the knee joint itself. This is a normal knee exam. Kind of have a thigh bone, shin bone, and you can see that dark space in between the thigh bone and the shin bone. There's um, three spaces in the knee. There's the inside, outside, and under the kneecap. Inside, outside, and then under the kneecap is another view. But that space is an error. That's cartilage. That's the cartilage keeping the, ba the, the bones from rubbing against each other. It's the cartilage cushion. And as that cartilage cushion wears out, you can see on the inside, this would be more of a bow-legged deformity where you have wear on the inside tread, not on the outside. And it's bone rubbing against bone right in through here. And there's a nice space there. That's what causes all the pain of arthritis. The nerve endings are in the bone. Cartilage has no nerve endings. And when that cartilage or cushion wears out, that's what becomes, the, becomes spurs and bone-on-bone -bone arthritis of that knee. This is some radiographs kind of depicting um, a normal knee here, the white being normal cartilage, the red kind of showing that wear of the arthritis or the cartilage on the end of the bone. And this is an illustration of a knee implant uh, of an uh, implant where we kind of resurface the end of the bone here and the tibia, the shin bone, and a piece of plastic in between. And the piece of polyethylene or plastic is that new cushion that's in between the knee itself. And there will be, we go through x-rays and some technology advances here later in the presentation. X-rays of the hip. It's more of a ball and socket where the knee was three compartments, the ball and socket. There's the ball there and then the cup there and you can see that space right in between the two and that's the cartilage and the cushion on the end of the bone. Here that space is gone, it's whitened out and the bone's starting to rub against the bone, that space is kind of obliterated up in the top superior lateral portion of that hip joint where the bone is rubbing against the bone and that's where the cartilage is lost causing the pain and hip arthritis and leading to stiffness over time as well. Illustration of a normal joint, the white the eroded cartilage on the end of the bone. This is a hip implant where there's a cup, a stem, a ball and liner that becomes the new uh, socket that gives more mobility and less pain um, because the bone's not rubbing against the bone anymore. We're kind of going through some non-surgical or treatment uh, options. Um, this is non-pharmacological, meaning um, what can we do besides uh, medications. Um, education, one of them is coming to lectures like this, just educating and understanding the, the disease process uh, weight loss, again, we talked about the more weight on the joints it translates into uh, pounds and pressures on the joints themselves every three to four pounds. Uh, every pound that we lose translates to three to four pounds of pressure that the knee feels. So um, every 10 pounds that we can lose is 30 to 40 pounds of, the, of pressure that the knee feels. Physical therapy, keeping that range of motion, keeping that, uh, that mobility in the joint is key. Exercises, again, keeping that strength in the muscles around the hip and knee. Aquatic therapy is another area where um, you, the buoyancy of the water relieves a little pressure on the joints of the hip and knee, uh, uh, allowing an environment that's a little bit more less painful um, to do um, cardio activities to try to lose weight and keep exercise in key. Um, 
There's braces and wedges um, in the shoes and also braces for the knee to relieve pressure on the um, certain areas of the bone to help um, decrease the amount of pain maybe at the end of the day. There's the braces up here. They're kind of knee sleeves with a hole punched out. These are not over-the-counter braces that I'm talking about. These are actually ones that are prescribed to kind of help uh, balance some of the knees. I have patients that swear by these that can't play 18 holes of golf without one of those uh, or they're going to pay for it at the end of the day. There's the aquatic pool. And then also functional things throughout the day, raised seats, raised toilet seats. Those things are just make it easier um, as well. Drug treatment or medication treatment. Analgesics is our pain medicine. These are kind of like the Tylenol, acetaminophen. Um, they work differently uh, than the anti-inflammatory medicines, the NSAIDs, um, which are like your Advil, Motrin, Aleve, those types of um, medications. There's also oral steroids. However, oral steroids on long-term use have long-term side effects that we want to avoid. In our articular injections, uh, we have two types. There's cortisone and viscosupplementation injections. The cortisone um, helps with the anti-inflammatory. I kind of liken arthritis to fire. Um, it's an inflammation, and what's, what's the water, so to speak, on the fire is um, anti-inflammatory medicines, whether it's a medication film, whether it's a gel or a topical form, whether it's an inter uh, uh, cortisone injection, oral steroid. The cortisones are typically our biggest water hose on the fire, so to speak. And viscal supplementation injections, these have multiple different brand names, Synvisquen, Suparts, uh, Uflexa, there's multiple different brand names, usually a series of injections. These are lubricating or jelly injections that we call them. They, nothing is uh, putting cartilage back on the end of the bone. This is also helping with inflammation of the joint itself. So these are injections that we do into the joint that can do, uh, have more long-term effects than cortisone injections and uh, try before you know, surgical uh, options are uh, tried. Let's see. Tylenol, Altram, and then we get into the narcotics. Um, Altram and or narcotics are the, obviously the prescription where the Tylenol is over the counter. Kind of have to watch our dosage of that because that can have long-term effects on the kidney, I mean, on the liver, uh, rather. Anti-inflammatory medicines, diclofenac, naproxen, ibuprofen, Celebrex, and Mobic are kind of the prescription strength uh, anti-inflammatory uh, medications. These are the cortisone injections, um, typically. We do these right in the office. You can have three to four a year. Every three to four months, we could do something like this based on a dosage standpoint. Um, everybody's a little different in how they're affected. Some people, they swear by them and get them every three to four months. Some it's, can last up to a year. Typically, with arthritis, the more advanced your arthritis is, typically these injections aren't as helpful. For it. So it's a shorter duration, and they don't provide as much pain relief, the more advanced the arthritis is. The more milder forms um, can have longer duration of time with this. And this is, these are injections that I'm talking about when the cartilage is lost. These are um, not something that we would do with healthy cartilage in there. This is cartilage where it's already worn. The brake pad tire tread analogy is kind of being worn already. And this is uh, uh, something that we're doing to avoid the pain of arthritis. Lubricating injections, we kind of mentioned there, those are some of the brand names based on insurances, what, which one we do, um, what covers what. Um, they are every six months uh, that we can do these based on insurance coverages. Um, and they can give, they're usually, uh, Synvis comes in Synvisc 1. Um, there's uh, Uflex injections that are every a series of three injections spread out by a week apart. Suparts is five spread out by a week. Um, again, these aren't building cartilage on the end of the bone. These are helping with the inflammatory markers within the knee, within the fluid and the synovial fluid of the knee itself. Glucosamine chondroitin, um, there's the dosages up there, the recommendations of a supplement. Uh, again, this is the key. There's no magic pill. There's, no, there's nothing to slow the progression. There's nothing to build cartilage back on the end of the bone. Once that process is in motion, what this is doing is helping with the inflammatory markers or pain of knee arthritis. So um, this isn't building cartilage on the end of the bone. This is helping it relieve the anti-inflammatory effects or markers that are causing the pain signals within the hip or knee. Since I said there's no magic bullet out there or pill that you can take to build cartilage on the end of the bone, joint replacement is what is needed 
not saying that it's like a heart condition in the sense that we have to do this now or else something bad's going to happen like a heart attack. This is something like it's bad, we're doing the joint replacement for pain and the relief of pain, relief of stiffness, and the relief of getting you back into activities of life because activity is the key to life and health is exercise and mobility. And these are this numbers showing that I'm, it sounds like I'm going to be busy for a while is what this statement says here. So um, I look at this, these numbers are always ever increasing, so um, exponentially. So in 2030, um, estimated number and jump in total knee replacement and uh, revision surgeries are just you know, increasing as we, um, the population grows. But this is, this is a scary thought to a lot of patients. Everybody's path to surgery is different. Um, I, we kind of skimmed over a lot of the, anti or the non-surgical treatments for hip and knee arthritis. Again, um, we're going to go into a lot in detail of surgical advances, technology out there, and I don't want to skew that all by, you know, everybody needs surgery. This is a conversation you have with your surgeon. This isn't a decision that I'm making. This is a decision we're making together. This is a decision that you're asking questions. I'm, uh, you know, when the injections aren't working, when the pain medicine's not working, when, you know, your quality of life is dictated by the pain of hip and knee replacement is when you decide to have surgery. And there's not, I'm not saying that surgery is without risk. We can go into some of that as well. I think that we've minimized risk very well, especially at this institute, that in surgery we can discuss and we can talk about the real questions and the real numbers and the real data out there with surgery. Um, but I'm not saying minimizing that surgery is, uh, you know, it, there is risk to surgery. It is a big deal. Um, and everybody's path to getting there is a little different. I'm going to try to go over some of these um, questions and go over them with you. And... Uh, before we kind of take that leap and, and uh, go over some of the surgical options and the technology out there. So surgical options, um, you know, it's, this is starting um, very non-invasively with arthroscopy. Or this is a scope. I think do we go over some of these individually. We're going to go into quite extensively. A scope is basically used for, um, it, it's a, it's a, minimally invasive, two little poke holes in the front of the knee or the hip. Uh, we're using instruments the size of a pencil or pen um, with a lighted telescope and a camera and a shaver to kind of go in and, and look at things. We usually do this to repair cartilage, meniscus, cartilage rings that are damaged. We can go and repair these. Typically, though, we save this arthroscopy for when the cartilage on the end of the bone, the articular cartilage, is pristine or in very good condition in the sense of the, the tires and the brake pads full tread on them, but there's a tear in it or there's, you know, it's like I liken it to a puncture in a tire. I mean, we can go in and fix the puncture in the tire and get the tire. It doesn't mean the whole tire is bad. The tread on there is good, but it's got a puncture in it. And so what we're doing arthroscopy for is for preservation, anytime there's preservation of the joint, we can do different procedures to kind of save the preservation of the articular cartilage on the end of the bone. Osteotomies, these are um, quite um, extensive surgeries where we're actually, if there's a deformity from birth or trauma that reorientates the bone, we're doing cuts in the bone to re make the overall alignment more uh, corrective in line with uh, a natural nat or normal anatomy. Um, it's kind of like in your ti a lot of tire analogies, but um, the osteotomy is getting a rotation on the tires to get the pressure off the inside or outside to relieve the pressure to prevent the loss of cartilage again. These two procedures are usually used when the cartilage on the end of the bone or that space is still there, and we're trying to prevent the loss of that down the, the road. Partial knee replacement, total knee replacement. We'll get into that a little bit as well. I said the knee is made up of three compartments, inside, outside, and under the kneecap. Partial knee replacement is resurfacing or, or, or the bad portion. So I, most of those pictures you saw arthritis or bone rubbing against bone in just one compartment. Partial knee replacement is where we're going and resurfacing that one compartment, not all three compartments like a total knee would be doing. Um, hip resurfacing, total hip replacement. We'll get into this a little bit more and the differences. I think we have some pictures coming up. 
These are not good reasons to have surgery. Um, my family thinks I should have it. My friends think I should have it. Definitely not my surgeon thinks I should have it. And I want to get it done now before it gets too bad. Um, these are not good reasons. These are, more, these are better uh, reasons to have it done. I'm miserable because of it. I can't get around and do the things I want to be doing, enjoy my life anymore, the quality of life. I'm not getting and doing those things on a data basis. Um, and I can't walk without it hurting or, you know, it's hurting because it, without, you know, the, the injections or the medicine aren't helping the, the pain as well. Knee replacement surgery. This is a picture of a total knee replacement on x-ray. We had that illustration before. This is a metal implant on the end of the bone where we're making, you know, where that bad cartilage is. We're reshaping or shaving off the end of the bone in uh, very precise cuts to cap the end of the thigh bone and then cap the end of the tibia or shin bone and then putting a piece of polyethylene in between the two. Um, again, getting over better overall corrective alignment, making the leg a lot straighter versus the bow-legged or you know, knock knee appearance. And we typically cement these components in, uh, not always, um, but we can get into some of that too. Advances in knee replacement. Um, you know, I, the advancement in technology with total knee implants, there's a lot of things on the market. There's gender implants. There's, well, one company markets it gender implants. There's custom implants. And there's partial replacements that we kind of talked a little bit. We'll get in a little bit in custom implants and what custom means. Um, custom, these are all pictures of a, a model of a bone of how we used to or how we do do surgery with tools and instruments and alignment rods and I take my measurements to get these implants in proper position and, and this is all kind of carpentry or shop talk and this is how we used to do, or do this just routinely um, without the custom technology that we have where we're aligning you know, on the bone, I'm making these decisions at the time of surgery where it's kind of, you know, eyeballing it with the measurement rods and these types of things to get the overall alignment precise where we need to be done. Well, we have technology now in the form of CT or MRIs uh, where we get MRIs or CT where we get the shape and mapping of the bone before the surgery. So I can get one individual's knee and see the deformity and the structure and map out the knee um, on, X, you know, on the MRI, and I can map out the size and shape and where these implants are going based off of the MRI. Um, and doing a lot of the um, you know, pre-planning or, or interoperative uh, planning that I do before the surgery even happens. And so I'm doing this on the computer and allowing, you know, getting the shape and the match and the precision of where we need and knowing what size specifically is needed to that individual's knee. And these are the custom guides that the company actually makes based off the MRI that I fit and shape on the end of the bone where I'm using these to make my cuts um, at the time of surgery to get that overall alignment a lot more precise and, and, and custom shaped and size for that individual. This is just showing me and mapping me before um, where the bone cuts I make are and illustrating where the implant is going to lie before. Um, and this has made our precision at the time of surgery uh, a lot better, it's been proven. It's also shortens the length of surgery where I'm taking a lot of this mind work out of the surgery itself and putting that ahead of time, um, which leads to shortened surgery but also improves the blood loss because the surgery is a lot um, uh, shorter in length and also improves the accuracy at which these implants are being put in. Um, gender knees, again, um, there's a stat up there, women receive over 60% of total knee implants. Female anatomy is a different than male anatomy. Um, there's different ratios in the, um, in the size and shape of the femur morphology-wise and uh, have less prominence. There's implants out there that are being created with narrower um, devices to, to uh, not all knees are the same, basically, and, and trying to um, take into account for all that. This is a partial knee implant illustration. Again, here the bad arthritis is just localized on the inside portion of the knee, pristine cartilage on the outside, pristine under the inside. And what we're doing is going in with a third of the implant size, reshaping or just covering the end of the bone here where the bad arthritis or the loss of cartilage was, piece of plastic metal, same concept, but about the third of the size. That means 
third of the size is, and we get into incisions, minimally invasive, less invasive, all this kind of marketing and, and conversations about that. The implant, I don't have a real implant with me, but the implant is probably bigger than the size of my fist um, on both ends. And these implants, I don't have the boat in the bottle kind of trick to get that into the knee. So there has to be an incision to get that implant in. But this implant is probably a third of the size, so I'm making incisions a lot smaller with this, not, a, you know, not cutting muscle with this, uh, with a partial knee implant. Now, I'm not saying everybody's a candidate for a partial, but um, you know, where we're not cutting the ACL and PCL ligaments, um, we are cutting less muscle, we're making smaller incisions, so the recovery times with a partial are a lot quicker than with a total knee implant. More natural feeling knee um, as well. And there's x-ray viewing of that, where the, you know, bad arthritis just on the inside portion of the knee again, where we go in, piece of metal, piece of metal, but see the space on the outside is preserved overall. This is an x-ray of a total knee implant. A lot more bone is taken away uh, with this implant. Um, a lot more metal is placed in the knee. Again, less invasive, quicker recovery, usually overnight in the hospital, go home the next day. More natural feeling knee, and you get your range of motion a lot quicker with uh, a partial knee replacement, typically. These are averages. Um, I'm pretty sure these are averages for probably my patient population. Hospital stays are typically two to three days after a knee replacement. We're talking a total knee replacement with partials. It's usually overnight and go home the next day. Um, physical therapy, exercise afterwards is very um, key to get that range of motion because we can get stiffness and scar tissue after forming it and uh, that can reoccur after the surgery if we don't start moving it afterwards. So um, you're permitted to golf, walk, swim, bike, dance, all these. Um, the lower impact activities are very key. I like that type of activity to, um, for activity and um, of after a knee replacement. Now running and higher impact activities, those are some things that you could talk to your individual surgeon about, but it's something that, I, you know, if there's other forms of non-impact uh, activity that we can do, I think those are uh, help for the longevity of a hip or knee implant. This is a hip surgery x-ray. Um, this is actually a, quite a lengthy stem. I use a lot more bone-preserving stem where my stem usually comes up to around here. Um, this is a picture depicting uh, one of, uh, this is actually a, one of the pioneer stems in orthopedic implants, and I did fellowship with Dr. Ng, who was one of the designers of that stem that's pictured there. Um, this is a socket up here with metal, a ball liner, and uh, a stem that goes into the ball there. Again, this is that stem pointing out. He revolutionized, actually, the concept where I said we cemented in knee implants. He revolutionized the concept of where this is more titanium, a porous coated titanium cup and stem where the bone will actually grow onto the metal and become one with that where we don't cement hip replacements anymore typically uh, with uh, primary hip osteoarthritis and the bone will actually grow in onto the stem and uh, we found that the longevity of those stems are a lot better. I think I said that already. Uh, minimally hip in incisions are becoming a lot smaller, and what does all this mean? We'll kind of get into a little bit of this. This is a very key um, slide, actually, in, um, in the commercials, and you hear about uh, knee implants or hip implant um, and recalls, and where are they, what is this all about? Um, it all has to do with the bearing surface, and you hear a lot about metal-on-metal metal implants these days. Um, you hear about certain companies with a certain implant and they have a recall on that. And what does that all mean? Well, I liken it again, a lot of car analogies, tires, and now we're talking about cars, but cars get recalled It doesn't, you know, for certain reasons, for certain years um, that they were found to be um, not good um, and they're taken off. doesn't mean that necessarily a whole car company is bad. It just means a particular year of an implant or a particular type, but metal on metal bearing surface is what is getting a lot of press these days. And, and I just said that, I just showed you a stem that's made of metal, I just showed you a cup that's made of metal. Um, so does that mean all implants are metal on metal? Well, that's a confusing part there. Um, all stems, all hip replacements um, have a metal stem and a metal cup. They're usually made of titanium. That doesn't mean that the bearing surface, what's actually rubbing or wearing is made of metal and metal. We have four parts and pieces in a hip implant. Um, 
It's a metal stem, a metal cup, and then we have a choice of a bearing surface. We have a ball and a liner, a liner that mates with the cup, a ball that mates with the stem. And that can be, the ball can be made up of a ceramic or a metal, metal or ceramic, or the liner can be made up of ceramic, it can be made up of metal, and it can be made up of polyethylene liner, which is a poly cross plastic, basically. And you can have any combination of those two. And what metal-on-metal -metal prostheses are, are when the bearing surface, the ball is made of metal, and the liner is made of metal. And what can happen is you can form metal ion debris that can occur, and people can get hypersensitivities to that metal ion debris that occurs. And if that were to occur, your body can treat that as foreign. Um, it treats it like uh, a foreign uh, material uh, where you can get uh, hypersensitivity to it and mount an immune response to it that can form like a pseudotumor in the muscle. And once that happens, um, the, mus the body destroys its own self in the, in the bu muscle. And when that happens, you're kind of left without a hip joint in the sense of the muscles deteriorated and you're not able to walk. And when that happens, I don't have a surgery. I don't have a correction for that. And that can happen. The variance out there is a little variable. It can happen in 1 in 300, 1 in 500. It's, um, and I can't predict who has it or who gets it. Um, and so in my practice, I've gone away from metal on metal. Um, hip resurfacing is basically all metal on metal. And we can get into that uh, as a different procedure in a total hip replacement. But my preference of choice is a ceramic on a holly cross link polyethylene for multiple different reasons. Um, you also have metal on uh, highly cross link polyethylene and then ceramic on ceramic. There's pluses and minuses to all these, and we can get into specific questions if you have those later. In total hip replacement, um, we, I didn't brush upon this. There's robotics out there. There's navigated uh, surgery. There's all forms of different things floating around in the marketing and what all this is. Um, basically, the, those are all tools or instruments, the MRIs, the CTs, the robotics, the navigation, all those things and all fancy marketing tools are just to help the surgeon get the parts and pieces in the way they need to be put in. Um, that's bottom line. Now, does that really translate to better surgery outcomes or recovery or pain for you? Not necessarily. It can help with long, you know, alignment that can help the long-term longevity of a prosthesis. But that doesn't necessarily mean that that's less pain, quicker recovery for you. What, is that, what, is, what does uh, translate to that? And in hip replacement surgery, what that translates into is different approaches to doing the carpentry work of what I'm talking about. How we go about doing the hip replacement is the approach, the incision, where the incision's made. And in an anterior approach hip replacement, there's lots of different terms out there as well for this, um, is a muscle sparing approach. Um, which actually goes kind of more in the front versus the side or the back. And through the anterior approach, um, why do I go in through the front? Well, the muscles in the front are more band-like. Um, there's a natural tissue plane that we can work through. I can part them like a curtain, do the carpentry work that we, the parts and pieces, the stem, the cup, the ball, and liner. And when we're done, the curtain kind of falls back, muscles not detached, and always sutures up the skin. That translates to a lot less pain, a lot quicker recovery, where I'm letting patients put as much weight on it as they can tolerate. Afterwards, there's no precautions like um, you know, not uh, crossing your legs or sitting too low or bending for a period of time because in traditional hip replacement, we go through the side or the back where we cut the largest muscles in our body and we have to allow them to repair or scar in, um, which can form a later limp afterwards. It can provide weakness and also increases the chance of dislocation, which is a complication after total hip replacement. And with anterior approach, um, not cutting the muscle, that, that lessens that likelihood dramatically. Traditional hip replacement surgery, we lay you on this side. Um, and like I said, we have to get in and expose the glute muscles, the biggest muscles in our body, and cut through them, because there's, there's no other way to get to the hip joint but by going through them. And the anterior approach, I use that, that was that table that they kept uh, showing in that video. Um, it looks like a torture device, but it's actually more natural um, position than laying on your side. You're laying supine on your back, I um, mean, laying flat on your back. Um, we put you in those special ski boots there, but that allows me to move that leg to show me the window of what to work in in a lot smaller 
incision, and it's a lot more technically challenging surgery to do because of the position. I have to position one, the leg once for the position of the cup and then also for the, the proximal femur to get another look at it in a different way, and I have to position that leg to do that, and this table aids in that very well. A little history on the anterior approach. A lot of patients ask me, is this, why, is this, why am I just hearing about this, or has this been around for a while? Well, it's been around for a long time. Um, it's been in Europe for a very long time where they used the Jude table. Robert Jude in France actually was the one that first performed it. And Joel Mata is one of the American surgeons that uh, revolutionized the, that table that I talked about. He's actually in Santa Monica at the Hip Institute there um, in 2002. And the table brought about a um, uh, new uh, way of looking at this. And now there's uh, several surgeons in the area in this country doing it, very common in the East Coast and West Coast. Um, to have this done. I was one of the first probably large volume surgeons doing this in um, the Midwest or in the state of Michigan. Um, benefits, it's less trauma to the body, smaller incision, a um, lot less pain, quicker recovery. And we have some slides showing some of the data of the first year of patients uh, doing this. Are there downsides? I get that question as well. Is there downsides to the anterior versus posterior? Um, there used to be statements of um, higher blood losses with this surgery that usually has to do with the length of surgery. It takes a little bit longer. Um, again, that's a, in your own surgeon's hands. Those are differences, and we can kind of uh, get into some of those. Um, this is uh, kind of the whole recovery program that we provide um, here at Holland. Um, we kind of have a pre-op. Uh, Christy Dennett is the joint coordinator of the hospital. She has, it runs an education, preoperative uh, education class. We have booklets that uh, illustrate all of this. We have a multimodal pain protocol uh, where we have uh, medications delivered before the surgery itself. I do injections at the time of surgery. I do it under a, a spinal anesthetic where people are up a lot quicker. They're up the night of surgery, walking around the nurse's station after this procedure, uh, which re makes recovery a lot quicker. Majority of my patients stay overnight in the hospital, go home the next day. Um, they're walking with walker maybe in the first 24 to 48 hours uh, with a cane for one to two weeks, some wean from it within a matter of days. Walking unassisted is very typical at the two-week mark. Um, those are exaggerations. Um, I th it, these are longer uh, recovery times than, I, uh, than I'm accustomed to. Um, driving, I typically have a conversation with at the two-week mark uh, for people. Um, returning to work varies for everybody's job and what they need to do. I say generally three to six weeks, um, but that's not works. Um, uh, three to six weeks afterwards in golf, um, you know, have people returning to all kinds of different activities um, in those time frames and a lot quicker. I had one triathlon uh, or a triathlete um, getting back to his bike routine within a week after surgery. This is uh, 2011. This is hip patients. Um, I guess this would be my patients. Um, we had stage bilateral hips. I guess there is the first one performed probably in the state of Michigan, maybe in just the wet Midwest, or in the, the, the West Michigan. That was that movie you saw, or that video, um, that was performed in, uh, in 3 of 12. Um, these are talking about the demographics, so the age range from 38-year-old to an 89-year-old, um, and then there's a percentage of females there. This is average length of stay. Um, for all comers, um, all ages, ranging from the 89-year-old to the 38-year-old, uh, 1.5 days overall. 63% um, home, day one. Um, and then you can see the 31 and then 6 needing discharge. Most of those are going to um, an extended stay, but that's only 6% of the patients. These are just some numbers I had them include. 94% um, are discharged home. I get that question a lot too. Am I able to go home or do I have to go to a rehab facility? Um, majority of my patients, 94% go home. Six of them go to a rehab facility. Um, that's something, a decision we make and, and talk about, but the majority of patients feel comfortable going home because they're in a lot less pain than what they came in with. Again, these are, these are now numbers con comparing this to the national averages. Of uh, This is rating pain. Patient comes in my office pre-surgery, two weeks after surgery, and then four weeks after surgery. And that's what they're saying, that their pain is either mild or to no pain. 
with different activities there. So you can see somebody coming in, they're rating no pain percentage very low. So a lot of people are in a lot of pain before surgery. That makes sense for a lot of these different activities. Two weeks after surgery, mild to no pain. That number increases dramatically. It increases more at four to six weeks. And you can see that my national average percentage at four to six weeks to six months national averages are equal or better. Again, this is, this is difficulty with activity. So this is getting um, all these different activities to the left. Again, difficulty with that, how hard or easy it is, difficult before surgery, how it's improved two weeks after surgery. This is four weeks after, and this is national average at six months compared to six weeks. I forgot to mention Tom Watson had an anterior total hip replacement. And he actually... This is uh, this British Open when he did very well recently, or a few years ago. Um, and uh, this is after his total hip replacement and still competing very successfully. Again, this is a little bit on Holland Hospital. Uh, we talked about that a little bit. Um, Christy Denner is the joint coordinator. That's the number. Um, and we'll just kind of leave it to questions. I, and I thought I'd leave more time, but... Yeah. So I have a lot of patients that come into my office have hip pain or knee pain. I have a lot of patients come into my office that say, or have low back pain, and I work with a lot of neuro neurosurgeons in my office, and we kind of go back and forth between hip, back, pinched nerve in the back, bursitis, tendonitis, arthritis in the hip, and what, where, what pain is causing what. And a lot of times it can be diagnosed in a simple x-ray, not always. Sometimes we need an MRI to look for pinched nerves and things like that. I have a lot of patients that come in with knee pain, I get an x-ray of their hip, and it's bad arthritis in the hip. It's not their knee. It's not arthritis in the knee. It's referred pain from an operator nerve in the hip that's causing their knee pain. You do a hip replacement on them, and their knee pain goes well. Well, they, you know, it's kind of, it's a process, because they didn't come in for hip pain, and they're getting a hip surgery. But that's kind of where you, that's an answer to your question. A lot of this stuff is connected. And so um, knee pain can manifest, you know, in, in, in in different ways. Hip pain can cause different pains. And you're right, leg link discrepancy from trauma, um, meaning a short leg on one side or a long um, leg on another side. Um, hip arthritis and painful gait, you know, where people limp and can throw out the back if that's done over a course of years, walking like that. And so that can cause the back issues or arthritis or pinched nerves in the back. So, you know, hip replacement surgery or knee replacement surgery can kind of regain that function and help with multiple different things. Is that an answer to the question? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, everybody, and I don't mean to, these are all averages. Everybody's average is different. Everybody, um, you know, is different how they came into surgery. So the question is, um, a patient in Chicago had their knee replaced, was up walking without a cane within a week. Um, you know, it's one of those things where is that a different surgery or different technology? Um, everybody's different or their norm is different. So, I, you, know, everybody, you know, this patient could have been a triathlete or something before. Now, I'm not saying that's the case, but she could have been very active. Some people are wheelchair bound before surgery and things like that. So I just put it out there. I, know, I don't know the specifics, but I'm just saying everybody's normal is different. And so those things can occur with most anything. Now, um, there is, uh, I, know, uh, uh, I know Rush and uh, the institute down in Chicago, they're, they do do a minimally invasive knee or a muscle sparing type approach, which, um, again, like I said, I've, I've been trained in and we can, do, we can do that all the time. It's just, uh, did she have a partial where I'm saying the incision's a lot smaller and she had a total knee replacement. And so there are muscle um, sparing approaches, like I just talked about anterior approach for the hip. There are muscle sparing approaches for the knee, which people can get their range of motion back. Now, do those muscle sparing approaches say that they get their range of motion back a lot quicker versus you know, a, uh, an inch long more incision or things like that, that hasn't really played out. But I'm not saying that there's, and also a lot to, key to factor to that is the pain control and management and how that's dealt with around the time of surgery. I kind of talked about that multimodal effect of um, where we're t doing medicines ahead of time, we're um, doing them under spinal anesthetic, we're doing um, injections into the muscle and in, around the scar and capsule at the time of surgery to improve or lessen the pain of the surgery around the knee itself to allow patients to get that range of motion and up a lot quicker. So I know that in Chicago they do that as well. That's very common at joint institutes um, around the country to do that. Yeah, so spinal anesthetic, which I would say, I don't know what my percentage is, but I would say it's probably higher than 90% of hip and knee replacements. 
spinal anesthetic, um, you have a spinal, you have, we come in, have an IV placed, and the spinal anesthetic is placed, and that makes your legs go numb for about the, the duration of the surgery, a little bit longer than the actual duration of the surgery. We give you s sleepy medicine, I call it, or I don't care medicine, um, through the IV. Um, it's called, um, and it's one of those things where you're taking a nap through the entire case. It's not where you're completely put under, though. It's not where we're taking a breathing tube for you, a breathing tube done under general anesthetic where we're breathing for you for the surgery. Um, but you are taking a nap. You're going to a vacation place wherever you choose. You, you, you don't really care what I'm doing. That's not to say that I'm pretty loud in the surgery sometimes, and sometimes you may hear some of that, but it's not that you care or anything like that. It's not like you're visualizing any of this. Um, I have a lot of patients come back, have their favorite choice of music on their iTunes or whatever, earplugs, put them in, take a nap, and they wake up not knowing anything happened. Mm -hmm. But, but it's a lot better. You wake up a lot more alert and with it. A lot less side effects of the general anesthetic with nausea, vomiting, and things like that. And, um, and you feel a lot. You wake up and you, you don't feel any pain because your legs are, you know, numb, so to speak, you know, from that until it wake, you know, until that wears off. And then I put that injection to kind of help with that as well. So a lot less side effects with, than with the general anesthetic. Yep. Um, it's not as brittle as like a wishbone where you just kind of snap and crack it. And it can be in uh, really bad bone or osteoporotic bone, so I'm not downplaying that. But typically you have cortex, which is the hard, strong bone on the circle. And we're, it's, a, it's a tube, and inside is the, the cancellous bone or the soft uh, uh, bone. And, and basically the, the cortex is nice to have as a structure, but it's where that cancellous bone is actually what is mating with the titanium that will grow onto the prosthesis and become one with it over time. And so it's, what we're doing is when I go in there, I use a brooch system where I'm compacting the bone and not removing it, I'm compacting it and condensing it out and packing it in real tight. And that's what I talked about. We don't cement the, the hip prosthesis anymore. I'm wedging this, this uh, titanium. It's kind of a three-point wedge, which gets locked in there. And um, it's very, very tight because it's a three-point fixation. And then that over time, that bone will actually grow onto the prosthesis in time. Mm -hmm. Sure, yeah, 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 it's one of those things where um, we are not cementing anymore because cementing is kind of like a tile analogy. It's like a grout. And so, like, if you walk over a tile, that can wiggle free with time, and that parts and pieces can wiggle free with this. Um, this procedure is a technology where it's, it's, it's been around for a while, but it's the bones growing in on, and becoming kind of a, a one. So as you stress it, it will actually grow and remodel around the prosthesis. It's tile. Like a healing bone, exactly. Exactly. Yep. And that can take several weeks to grow into a prosthesis, but I allow you to put as much weight on it as afterwards if there's a nice tight fit because it's not going anywhere. It's a wedge and it's not going anywhere. Mm -hmm. Typically, yes. I mean, it's a conversation that I have with a patient. Um, obviously, your, your arthritis has to be com in one compartment to qualify. If you're in more than you know, two, uh, a compartment, then we're talking probably a total. Um, but we kind of talk about that. There's also one other stress view that I like to see to make sure that your ligaments open up um, because I use a special uh, custom implant for that as well uh, called an Oxford knee for my partials. But um, with that is that uh, I want to make sure the ligaments aren't contracted down and allow for room for a, uh, a partial to go in. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's a simple x-ray in a conversation, typically determination of a partial versus total. Yeah, it's, I get that question a lot. Are, so the question is, uh, after a knee replacement, are you able to kneel or bend down and put pressure on the knee? From a mechanical standpoint, I have no problem with it. That incision typically goes right over that kneecap after a knee incision, and sometimes you can get a numbness out here after a knee implant because there's a sensory nerve um, that, is, that goes right across the incision. It's a microscopic nerve, but it provides a little sensation here, and sometimes you can get numbness over here with a knee. Um, and sometimes people can have sensitivities where it's a little sore because the incision goes right over that kneecap and can become um, tender to do that or painful sometimes to kneel um, right over where the skin is. But it's not something that I limit somebody from doing, that they can't do that because of the prosthesis or something. If it's sore, I say there's other ways we can kind of do that. Um, but um, that's something that's a, you know, individualized for each patient. Not everybody's tender over the incision and, and can kneel. Mm -hmm. Good question. Good question. Um, 
Yeah, we have a protocol um, that's kind of set in. Um, he asked, uh, do I put a patient on a blood thinner, anticoagulant, after a knee replacement surgery? The reason, yes, we do. The reason we do that for is because of the risk of blood clot after the surgery. We didn't go through too many complications, um, but blood clots can be one of them. Um, with uh, the key to uh, preventing blood clots is mobility. Um, moving around, keeping that blood flow and the muscles active. And so with anterior approach to the hip or, you know, less invasive muscle sparing type approaches, people are moving a lot quicker. So risk of blood clots is a lot lower. I've almost gotten to the point of thinking of just putting somebody on an aspirin afterwards because it's so, such a low prevalence. Um, but that's not to say that it's still a risk. Um, there is a new medicine called Xeralto um, that I use on patients. I use it 24 days on the hip. It's a single pill once a day. Uh, with no blood monitoring. There's other uh, products out there called Lovenox, which is the injections um, that I've gone away from because of its an injection, a belly injection. Coumadin is another one that's uh, out there, um, but that needs blood monitoring every couple, of, uh, two times a week for that. So I've gone to a single pill, no blood monitoring for 24 days on the hips. For the knees, it's 14 days. The youngest patient for, knee for knee, yeah, for knee, uh, for knee replacement. Um, you know, I have a lot of younger patients for hip for multiple different reasons. You saw 38 up there. I did both of his hips. Um, I have a patient in my practice that's 21, needs a hip replacement. Um, and so I have very young patients in the hips. Knees, I generally s start seeing knee um, patients that are candidates for knee replacement surgery um, in their late 30s and 40s. Um, with the knees, we try to put that off as much as possible. Um, because there's different lots of different injections and things that we can do before needing a knee replacement to kind of help alleviate that. But uh, patients fall all over, you know, but I would say in the 40s is when I kind of see patients with uh, cartilage loss on the end of the bone, but that's usually from t some prior trauma or injury a lot of times as well. Huh? Older patients, right. So this is a question of defining old, and I, this is very, you know, I don't want to get into that, but... Um, <laughs> It's uh, one of those things where, you know, everybody's 80 is a little bit different. You know, I just had a patient, you might have saw her in the paper if you live in Holland. She's a patient of mine. That, I don't know if I'm supposed to say that or not, but she's 85 and just went skydiving. So everybody's a little different in what they're doing. And so um, that's why I just say that is she's 85 and skydiving, so she's very young and active um, in that sense and very um, committed to activity in that thing. So, and, you know, it's a lot different. It, it has a lot more to do than age. It has more of an issue to do with medical um, heart conditions or preconditions that may limit you from being a surgical candidate. It's not necessarily age. I have patients in their 80s. I have patients in their 90s. Um, I have some patients that aren't good uh, candidates for surgery, but they also come to me and say, i rather take on the risks of surgery to live the way I'm living. I can't, I'm bound to this wheelchair, I can't move, I can't walk, and I'd rather, you know, take on the risks of surgery than continue, you know, the way I'm living now. And that's an individual choice for everybody. I'm not saying that's the case for everybody, but that's some patients' decisions. Mm -hmm. Good question. So, what's the life expectancy of a hip or knee implant? And, um, is the question. There's no, it's not like a car, right? You don't get a warranty um, with that. So, if something does go bad, what, you know, you don't really get that with an implant. I always wondered that. Um, that always falls back on me somehow, but um, uh, the question is, it has to do with, your question I think you're asking is, the, you know, the plastic or the polyethylene becomes your new cartilage, it's the bearing surface, that's your new brake pad or your disc pad, and how long does that wear, the, you know, going back in the cycles on that, and that's what you're asking, how long does that, you know, typically last. I try to get as much poly in there as I can, the liner, the thickness of it. So obviously the thickness has some matter to do that and has some to do with anatomy and things like that. Also has some an uh, analogy to how hard are you going to be on it, how, how many miles are you going to drive on it, and how are you going to treat the car, so to speak. So that has some por portion of it as well. Um, a good question you answer. I don't have a number for you. Um, I'm kind of getting at this in the sense of um, the newer poly or the technology in the polyethylene out there is highly cross-linked now. We used to saw, see with the older plastics that over time it used to wear like this. As time went on, it wore, and the line was kind of linear. Now, with the newer plastics, we kind of, in the first year it does that, but then over the last 10, 15 years, it's kind of flat, you know, plateaued. And not to say that this is, in the labs, you can hear of like a 30-year knee or something like all these claims out there, but that's 
in the lab where they're just kind of running this thing at a million cycles in a year and speeding that up. That doesn't mean that we have these implants, these newer technology implants in patients that long. And so it's hard for me to predict that, but with the newer technology and what we're seeing, for a lot of patients, I have a majority of my patients are probably under the age of 65. Um, and I say to them in the very active, um, you know, I say, it's, have fun trying to wear this out. You know, I, I think a lot of patients think, you know, I'm too young, I don't, you know, worry about that. But it's more of if your pain is, you know, and your quality of life is dictating what you do, um, I think the technology is there to match it in the sense of you live your life now. Um, living in pain and not doing things for the next five years to put off, you know, you know, five years away or something on the implant, I don't think that's the right mentality anymore of where we're at. There are. Um, uh, there, he's asking if there's uh, different criteria if a patient meets um, that makes them qualify to a candidate for a different hip procedure. Um, we kind of briefly mentioned hip um, resurfacing. There's total hip replacement. And there's also and some nuances with uh, anterior total hip replacement. Now, I do about, uh, I'm getting to be about eight a week here uh, with this. And um, I do probably the most volume of anterior total hip replacement. And I'm not saying that all surgeons would be comfortable taking on all sizes, all weights of patients. Um, I very minimally uh, limit patients based on size or something like that on, on a candidacy for a procedure. Um, there are some nuances in bone structure from prior surgery or hip uh, trauma or something like that that may not make them the best candidate. But I do most all anterior approach now. I do revision surgery through that. I do redo surgeries through that. I do um, failed surgeries through this. So I'm quite comfortable with that approach. So I can do major revision surgeries through that with similar results of two nights in the one night in the hospital, getting up and going, you know, kind of rehab and things like that afterwards. So there are, I guess it's one of those things where if you have a specific one, we can kind of go on uh, you know, all night with that a little bit with the different you know, nuances between the different procedures and things. But there are, but for the, um, all intents and purposes, if it's an anterior approach, I pretty much do. If it's your primary hip, there's very rare reasons why I would limit somebody from that. Yeah, so if that wears out, good question. Is that what your question is? If the polyethylene liner wears out, can, um, simplest case revision surgery for me is to, if that wears out, you know, another question was um, that, that I think I failed to mention that the, the parts and pieces grow into that bone. Um, tip, he's just asking if it just wear, if the polyethylene liner just wears out, what's the simple, well, let's go and break in, changing the brake pads or disc pads out. So going into the surgery, that ball's modular, the liner's modular, I put in a new liner and a new ball. The cup and the stem, solid in there. If they're solid in there, I don't have to touch them or do anything with that. Um, put in a new liner and a new ball. And that's the simplest uh, case scenario for that surgery. It's, even, it's worse if, if the cup or the stem became loose over time. And that's something a lot bigger surgery because I have to take, put in a lot more metal or a lot bigger stem or you know, remove more bone, um, similar with the hip or the knee. The knee's kind of the same way. Simplest case scenario, go in, pop out that old plastic, put in a new one. It's worse if the, the metal cap on each of the end of the bones became loose, then I have to go in with a lot more metal and replace or take a lot more bone off for a second or redo surgeries in the future. No, 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 I, I'm sorry, sorry, no, no. That, that is a revision surgery, and that, 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 is, that is a revision surgery, and that's, that's, but simplest case scenario, we're just swapping out the parts that's not done uh, with lasers or this or that. That's still a surgery that needs to be done at the hospital, right? <laughs> yeah, sorry. The VA, I do have a lot of... Um, um, patients that who are um, from the VA, if that's your primary sole um, insurance, it's one of those things that's a little tricky. It's kind of crossing on the toes a little bit there, but it's one that if they have some secondary insurances, and a lot of patients do, I have a lot of VA patients that have secondary insurances that had a surgery there and come to me for something else or a different procedure. Mm -hmm.